Amen. Well, if you would, we'll, start in, we'll be in, in Acts. It'll be a minute before we get there, but we'll be in Acts chapter 2. But I, uh, We're going to be in this for a while, continuing on with the Lordship Salvation that we started on Thursday. The uh, I guess you could call it a series. And there's just so much to cover on this. And I don't want to ruin your Sunday morning, but we're going to go back and read some more of that article I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> to you on Thursday, but uh, so the title of the message this afternoon is the ignorance of the Lordship Salvation crowd. So last uh, Thursday we talked about the uh, hypocrisy of the Lordship Salvation crowd. Today I want to talk about the ignorance of the Lord, Lordship Salvation crowd. And by ignorance, I I mean I literally mean like they they are ignorant of certain things in the Bible, or or maybe more specifically. They're ignoring certain things that are in the Bible. And it kind of gets frustrating to listen to that. But uh, I, I hope that not everybody that's kind of fallen into this Lordship Salvation doctrine, the teachings, sometimes it's hard to, uh, as I pointed out last Thursday, there's a little bit of admixture of truth in every false doctrine. So sometimes, uh, you know, there's some, some things that you can, you can hear them say and you think, I, I understand where they're coming from. I think they could be right. So I, I hope that the people that are falling into that teaching are not willfully ignorant. Does that make sense? But they've just been confused. They've been, uh, uh, you know, they've just heard so much false teaching that they don't know what to do with those verses. But make no mistake about it, they're, they're ignorant on some very uh, clear Bible teachings. And so I want to talk about that. When I read the rest of this article, because where I left off on Thursday was pretty much just kind of his introductory remarks. And some of us are having a hard time stomaching that, but... Uh, the, the, the end of that is going to be, uh, he said there was nine points. He said nine teachings that set Lordship Salvation apart from easy believism. And I want you to just listen as I go through these and see uh, how he just seems so confused going back and forth on some of these, some of these things. Okay, so uh, today all we're going to cover is this first paragraph. Uh, and I think you all would agree on this, that there's an ignorance about the repentance about repentance as it relates to faith, all right, and, and as it relates to salvation, really. And so listen to this first paragraph. Repentance is not a simple synonym for faith. I could agree with that. Scripture teaches that sinners must exercise faith in conjunction with repentance. Acts 2, 38, 17, 30, 20, 21, 2 Peter 3, 9. We're going to go through all these verses. I just really think it's, it's necessary. Repentance is a change of mind from embrace of sin and rejection of Christ to a rejection of sin and an embrace of Christ. Acts 3.19, Luke 24.47. And even this is a gift of God, 2 Timothy 2.25. Genuine repentance, which comes when a person submits to the Lordship of Christ, cannot help but result in a change of behavior, Luke 3.8. Acts 26, 18 through 20. I won't give you the references from this point on, but we're going to look at all those references today. But let me just go and read the rest of this article uh, to start this ser sermon off. Secondly, we're going to see that they're ignorant of what the new creation is. Okay, it says this. Number two, a Christian is a new creation and cannot just stop believing and lose salvation. Well, I, I understand. I agree with that. Faith itself is a gift of God. Now we're getting into Calvinism. And real faith endures forever. Salvation is all God's work, not man's. Those who believe in Christ as Lord are saved apart from any effort of their own. Again, some truth in, in that, but you see a little bit of a confusion, uh, which we'll explain later. Then we see there's an ignorance in uh, what it means to have faith in Christ. It says this, the object of faith is Christ himself. Not a promise, a prayer, or a creed. Faith must involve a personal commitment to Christ. It is more than being convinced of the truth of the gospel. It is forsaking of this world and following the Master. The Lord Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. Remember, he's not in the King James Version. <laughs> my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And we'll deal with all these. It's going to be hard for me not to jump in here now, but we'll deal with all these little by little. Uh, number four, you see they have, an, he, they have an ignorance. And again, he's summarizing John MacArthur and different people he's read after to be able to write this article. But, uh, th but here's, 
Uh, you'll recognize it too with Ray Comfort and a bunch of people out there right now that people are getting their, uh, their teachings from. And unfortunately, their evangelism from these guys. Their evangelism is being uh, influenced by Ray Comfort and people like that who are very much Lordship Salvation. So number four, you see their ignorance when it comes to the new nature, okay, or the inner man, the inner man. So here's what he says, number four. The true faith always produces a changed life. The inner person is transformed by the Holy Spirit, and the Christian has a new nature. Those, who, uh, those with genuine faith, those who are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, follow Jesus. They love their brothers. They obey God's commandments. They do the will of God, abide in God's word, keep God's word. They do good works. These are all he gives verses for all these. Uh, out of context, but that's another point. And continue in the faith. Salvation is not adding Jesus to the pantheon of one's idols. I agree with that. It is wholesale destruction of the idols with Jesus reigning supreme. Number five, you'll see, we'll see that they're, uh, they're ignorant as to what it means to have uh, the free gift of salvation. And you've often heard people say it's not just a free ticket to heaven or, or, or a get out of jail, I mean, get out of hell free pass or something. You've heard all that kind of stuff. Okay, so here's what he says. Uh, God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Salvation, then, is not just a ticket to heaven. It is the means by which we are sanctified practically in this life and by which we grow in grace. We'll see that they are uh, confused about what the Lordship of Christ is. Hey, none of us, I don't think anybody would disagree that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our Lord and our Savior, right? I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Yeah. So, so I don't understand, you know, that's another straw man argument that they use a lot of times uh, to say, you know, uh, you have to make Him the Lord. You can't just have Him as, as your Savior, you know. That's, it's, that's not what we're saying when we, when we use the phrase Lordship Salvation. And they, they, they should know that, but anyway. Uh, number six, okay, so the Lordship of Christ. Spirit, uh, I'm sorry, Scripture teaches that Jesus is Lord of all. Christ demands unconditional surrender to His will. Those who live in rebellion to God's will do not have eternal life. For God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Again, not King James. Uh, not, not quoting the King James. And so that goes back to the hypocrisy of the Lordship Summit. You trying to tell me that you have unconditionally submitted to God in everything in your life? I guarantee they haven't. So there's the hypocrisy going back and forth. And you're going to see this is because of ignorance on some of that. And so, so, they're, so they're kind of flip-flopping because they're trying to make reason of all these different scriptures. Instead of uh, understanding them, they just, they just kind of lump them all together. And you'll see that in the concluding uh concluding paragraph. So uh, let me see here. And then here's a big one. They, uh, oh wait, number seven first. They are ignorant when it comes to the love of Christ. Okay, it says those who truly believe in Christ will love him. All right, you got to define what love is. I, I agree that we should love Christ. I agree that when we love Christ, we're going to do good things. You know, we're going to show that, demonstrate that by our actions. But does that mean that everybody that's saved is just going to love show that love that kind of love at all times? No, there, you know, there's no way. So, uh, so uh, anyway, I'm not ready to preach that yet. But anyway, they uh, truly believe in Christ; they will love Him, and those we love, we long to please. Number eight. This is a, a an interesting one. The they're ignorant in re, uh, what we would call the reprobate doctrine or the, uh, the, the whole concept of having a reprobate mind, they're ignorant about what that means, and so that throws them off on a lot of passages of Scripture too. So uh, I'll talk about Judas Iscariot here in a minute. Scripture teaches that behavior is an important test of faith. Obedience is evidence that one's faith is genuine. If a person remains unwilling to obey Christ, he provides evidence that his faith is in name only. A person may claim Jesus as Savior and pretend, pretend to obey for a while, but if there is no heart change, his true nature will ev eventually manifest itself. This was the case for Judas Iscariot. The problem is, see, I'm not ready to preach this one yet. <laughs> but you understand, like, there's people out there that can live their life looking holy. 
and acting righteous and, and, and doing all kinds of wonderful. I mean, there's, there's a Catholic priests that live a pretty separated life. And most people would think, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe that was a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what I'm saying. There are people that are separated and can live holy lives, but they're not saved by, by if you just ask them, like the fruit of what, what is it that you believe? And when they try to explain the salvation, the, the fruit that's coming out of their mouth is you're not saved. All right. And so, uh, so it's ridiculous to say like, oh, just eventually, you know, the, the bad stuff will come out. Well, now they're looking at everybody who, who they think might be saved. And they're waiting for them to do something bad. And as soon as they do something bad, they say, oh, that person wasn't saved. That's hypocrisy. Because I just wait long enough, I'm going to find something that you do. That <laughs> Anyway, I'm not ready to preach that yet. First, uh, uh, number nine here. Uh, they are confused uh, and ignorant when it comes to what it, the preservation of the saints is the phrase that they use a lot of times. Genuine believers may stumble and fall, but they will persevere in the faith. This was the case for Simon Peter, a believer who continually turns away from the Lord uh, plainly shows that he was never born again. Wait a minute. <laughs> he was never born again to begin with. I got to read that again. Okay, okay, okay. Now, is, is he just got, I got confused because he said this was the case for Simon Peter, but I think what he's saying is that Simon Peter came back in the end or whatever, but he says, new, par new sentence, a believer who completely turns away from the Lord plainly shows that he was never born again to begin with. I still don't agree with that, but it, it, it makes a little bit more sense because that's what they always say. Now, let me give him this last little paragraph that he, that he says, and this is why I had Brother Justin read Romans 6, because that shows that they misunderstand Romans 6, which I think is so clear right. on, on so many ways that, hey, we shouldn't sin, right? We shouldn't sin, that grace may abound, but the implication is that it would abound if you did sin because it's the grace of God. It's not your works. And so, therefore, if you do sin... Uh, you know, grace would abound, but he's saying, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid, okay, we, we shouldn't do that. And it, we should reckon ourselves. Now, if it's the work of God and a person that gets saved, is just automatically God's just going to start making him be good. Well, why does he have to constantly reckon that he's a born again child of God and he has to live right? And so it's work and he has to constantly be diligent and make himself do good works, right? We, don't we all have to force ourselves? I mean, some it's going to be harder than others because of different things happen in their life or whatever. But, but we've got to uh, uh, make ourselves. And then it ends saying... The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, it can't be clearer than Romans 6, but they end saying this. A person who has been delivered from sin uh, by faith in, in, Christ, uh, in Christ should not desire to remain in a life of sin. And I agree we shouldn't desire that. Okay, but this, this paragraph, if, if that's what he's saying, is going to be contradicting everything that he said in these other places. Of course, spiritual growth can, occur, uh, can occur quickly or slowly depending on the person and his circumstances, and the changes may not be evident to everyone at first. Ultimately, God knows who are his sheep, and he will mature each of us according to his perfect timetable. So that's just straight Calvinism just saying, you know, eventually he will produce the fruit in you. And so I'm like, well, why do we even need to preach? Why do we even need to, you know, to worry about this, right? Because God's going to do it anyway. It is possible to be a Christian and to live like, well, I'm sorry. He says, is it possible to be a Christian and live in lifelong carnality, enjoying the pleasures of sin and never seeking to glorify the Lord who bought him? Can a sinner spurn the Lordship of Christ yet lay claim to him as Savior? Can someone pray a sinner's prayer and go about his life as if nothing had happened and still call himself a Christian? Lordship salvation says no. Let us, give unrepentant, let us not give unrepentant sinners false hope. Rather, let us declare the whole counsel of God. Ye must be born again. So don't let someone just believe that trusting in Christ is what saves them. You better imply to them that their works is what saves them. <laughs> I mean, that's what they're basically saying, like, don't give them a false hope now. You know, we want to wait and see if there's fruit. Well, that's called works-based salvation. Yeah. Right. And so it's so frustrating to see that just flop back. And sometimes, you see what I'm saying, though? Sometimes there's a little bit of truth in there, and you say, well, yeah, I can, I can understand that. But then it'll just hit you with this, this total false doctrine. Okay? So, so I want to talk specifically about that first one, 
where he says repentance is not a simple uh, synonym for faith. Scripture teaches that sinners must exercise faith in conjunction with repentance, okay? Uh, and what he means in each of these verses, he's talking about this repentance means, in fact, I think he defined that there. He says, uh, genuine repentance, which comes when a person submits to the Lordship of Christ, cannot help but result in a change of behavior. Now, if you're talking about just godly sorrow leads into repentance, you know, somebody after they're saved, because that's who that verse is talking about is, is to save people. After they're saved, right, then there's a the, then the Lord can chasten them, work in their heart, and, and it can it could lead them to a true repentance. Then I understand that. But he's talking about salvation right here. And so here's the verses that he uses. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. And I say these are the verses, this is the these are the verses that he uses, but remember, he's gathering this up from other sources and you know as well as I do you've heard these verses quoted to you probably many times and so we're just going to look at some of them and uh, and here's what will happen a lot of times uh, if you ever get into an online debate with somebody which I don't recommend about <laughs> about uh, repentance uh, doctrine what they'll do instead of explaining what each of these verses mean they'll just give you this long list of every verse that says repent they'll just like copy and paste all these verses that say repent, you know, and then they'll just put it, what do you think about those? Well, let's go through them, okay? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Start in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Lord uh, I'm sorry, he had made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so, they look at that and say, okay, see, the word repent is in there. And so in their mind, they're thinking you've got to repent of your sins. And in fact, they think it's confirmed because if you go on, it says, for the remission of sins. There we go. We got you. you got to repent, and you got to repent for the remission of sins. So therefore, you got to repent of your sins. But in the context, that's not what he's talking about at all. In fact, he's talking to people and saying that you crucified Christ. These are Jews most of them who probably considered themselves quite spiritual and considered that they were actually following the law pretty well. In fact, if you remember, what are some of the reasons they wanted to hang uh, Jesus Christ on the cross? He's working on the Sabbath day. He's doing it, and they're finding all these laws and stuff like that. They had no problem. Uh, I mean, I know there's hypocrisy involved, but they had no problem like understanding how to perform the law and to do the works of the law. But what he's saying is that you crucified Christ. You rejected him as the Messiah, and you put him on, on the cross, and you crucified him. And so what it says there in verse uh, uh, 37, then they're pricked in their hearts, and they said, what must we do? You remember last week we talked about in John 6, he says, well, what, what must we do? And he said, well, here is the work of God that you believe on him who he sent. And so, uh, so that's what he's talking about. And when they heard that, they said, what must I do? Then he said, repent and be baptized, everyone, for in, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Okay, what he's saying is, you, if you want your sins forgiven, he's not saying you've got to go to the priest and confess them. He's not saying you've got to uh, be real sorrowful and start shedding some tears or anything like that. What he's saying is, you want your sins forgiven, like you're going to die in your sins without Christ. And he says, you need to put your faith in Christ rather than your works, which the Jews were already believing in works. He's saying, you need to forget that. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Repent of basically what they were believing, right? And now you're going to put your faith on Jesus and accept him as the Messiah. Look at Acts 17. And it makes it, the, the Bible makes it clear over and over that it's the, it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sins. Okay? It's not our works that cleanses us. So, so when, it, when we're talking about the remission of sins, that's always going to be based on the work that Jesus did. Nothing to do with our own selves. Acts 17, verse 30. Let's 
So here's another one that's brought up a lot of times. In this list of verses that they just uh, copy and paste and say, hey, these are verses on repentance, okay? Verse uh, 30, 1730. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. So are you telling me then in the Old Testament nobody ever had to, you know, repent of their sins, but all of a sudden they have to repent of their sins now that Jesus came? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so let's look, what is it that we're supposed to repent of? Because remember, repent means to change, right? Now what they'll often tell you is, no, I don't know where they got this definition. You can't find it in the Bible. They say repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action, okay? And so but what they're saying is, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to turn from your sin and, you know, stop sinning, basically. So, but the Bible, when it talks about turning from something, you know, yes, you could be, you could be involved in a sin, turn from that sin, and turn, you know, to, to not sinning anymore. That would be a form of repentance. But sometimes it's just talking about turning from your false God that you're trusting in to the true God. Or turning from one thing that you were going to do and change that to, to not doing it anymore. So in verse 30 here, he says, uh, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. What are they repenting of? Well, if you go back up to verse 23, see, now he's not talking to Jews. Now he's talking to Gentiles. And guess what? These guys were idolaters, right? They didn't know the true God. They're worshiping idols. Verse 23 says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found the, an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. See what he's saying? You're in ignorance just worshiping this false God. And he's saying, you know, there was a time where this ignorance God winked at, but now he's coming. Now, that, why, why is he so demanding now that, that, that you repent? Because now Jesus has been revealed. It's no longer like searching for who's the Messiah, you know. It says Jesus has been revealed, and now guess what? The time is at hand, and you need to repent. And so this is the, the, the push became really strong for that. At the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth every man everywhere to repent. And what's he talking about? He's talking about uh, putting their trust in the true God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter Second Peter chapter three. Let's start at verse four. All right, let's do it. go with three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, "Where is the promise of his coming?" For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they were will they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world then was, uh, that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, in a thousand years as one day, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Uh, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Okay, so now he's talking to believers saying, if, God, if all this thing is going to happen, you know, what manner of, uh, uh, how did it say, uh, what manner of persons ought ye to be? Okay, so, so the, I, to me, this would be saying to the Christians, you know, don't you think that you ought to live a life uh, remembering that people are going to perish. The judgment is coming. He's going to destroy this world by fire. Now, 
when he says he's going to destroy this world by fire, the verse right before that, he's talking about how God destroyed the world by what? Water. And he said he destroyed it by water, and now the heavens are, shut, are, are waiting till the day that he is going to destroy it by fire. All right? Now, what does that story of the world being destroyed by water remind you of? Reminds me of the ark. What was significant about the ark? Well, in the days of Noah, as the ark was preparing, he was preaching. And uh, he was telling people that the Lord's judgment is coming. And you know what they had to do to be saved from that judgment? They just had to get on the ark. You know, if they had to change their lives in order to be saved from that judgment, then there's some guys that made their way on that ark that probably should have, like Ham, probably shouldn't have been on that ark. <laughs> but they had to get on the ark to be saved from the judgment that's coming. So, you know, when we're, t and, and if you remember, uh, uh, you know, he's preaching for 120 years and apparently nobody was, nobody was listening, right? But so what he's saying is, you know, the day is coming where God's going to do this again. So he's admonishing Christ Christians, right, to go out there uh, and tell people that this judgment's coming, that they need to turn to Christ. Okay, so that repentance has nothing to do with turning from their from their sins, it has to do with turning to Christ who can save them. It's kind of like saying, you need to get on the ark. You know, you need to get in Christ and be saved. All right, let's look at, uh, let me see here, Acts chapter 3. Again, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, let's start with verse 14. Let's start with verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob and the God of our fathers has glorified his son, Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life who God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, uh, and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all the prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Okay, so they catch on that phrase, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And what they say is, you've got to repent of those sins, and get them blotted out. But you don't see that anywhere in this passage. In fact, this passage made it very clear uh, you denied the Holy One. Uh, you know, we were witnesses that he died, was buried, rose again. And his name through faith in his name, uh, you know, is what made this guy strong. And then he's saying, uh, uh, you know, God has showed all the holy prophets. Now he's talking to Jews again. So he's reminding them all the holy prophets said that Christ was coming and you rejected him and you killed. Him. He even says, and it was probably an ignorance whenever you did it. I understand that. He's like, but now what you need to do is you need to repent. And what's he saying? Return to that. It's not saying, oh, we're so sorry that we hurt your son. Hey, guess what? Every one of us killed Christ by the sins that we committed. <laughs> he died for the sins of the whole world. He wasn't telling them, hey, well, if you can just tell him how sorry you are and stop sinning, he'll save you. He already died. He already shed his blood to cover the sins of the whole world. So he's saying you need to repent and turn to that guy because he's your Messiah. And you need to trust in him. And if you trust in him, uh, then you will be converted and your sins will be blotted out. That's the only way you can have your sins blotted out, you know. All right, let's go to Luke. Just got a few more here. Luke chapter 24. But it's like no one uh, that believes in this lordship salvation is, is concerned about context. They're just like, you got to preach repentance. you got to preach repentance. And that's why I say that some of this 
it's, I don't think it's just like these guys that are, 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 you know, working for the devil on purpose and willingly ignorant. I think some of them are truly saved. You'll read a track, you know, we've talked about this a hundred times, but you'll read a track and everything on it is right until they get to the end and they're just like, oh, I'm really scared about, you know, I don't want to give anyone false hope. And so you'll ruin a perfectly good track and say, now just repent of your sins and in repenting, call on Jesus to save you. And people are thinking, oh, whoa, whoa, I thought just Jesus paid for my sins. Well, what does this repenting part mean? Like I got to stop sinning? And I've heard people say, like one of these days I'll come, I'll come to the Lord, but I, you know, I got some things first that I got to get taken care of. I got to quit doing this, quit doing that. And, uh, and you know what? They're probably never going to get saved because you're never going to clean up good enough to win God's favor. You've got to just admit the fact that in your current condition, you're going to hell. You cannot earn your way to heaven. I mean, that's what the verses are it's so clear. You can't earn it. You have to trust in what Jesus did and the price that he paid to get you to heaven. And a person has to realize that. And so this is why the Lordship salvation is so, so dangerous, because at the point that somebody starts thinking, well, I've got to change my life. I've got to reform my life. I've got to turn over a new leaf. Then they're not trusting in Christ alone 100%. And that's the only way they can be saved. Look at Luke. Uh, did I finish that verse? I didn't even read it yet, did I? Luke 24. Because I'm not there yet. Luke 24. Let's go to verse 46. All right, he says, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And so, like again, what they're trying to say is that, uh, you know, Jesus died on the cross, paid the free gift of salvation for everybody. He paid, he paid for their sins. Why did he do all that? So that you can repent of your sins and be saved. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Why did he have to die if he's, if, if he's going to be impressed by how well you repent? You know, Jesus died and the repentance is to accept the fact that that alone is going to save me and not my works. And Lordship Salvation is teaching exactly the opposite, as subtle as it may be. And is, and is stopping a lot of folks from coming to uh, the understanding of the free gift of salvation. And so it's very dangerous. And even whenever someone's just kind of a little bit off on that, they're not like hardcore uh, lordship salvation, but they're just kind of a little bit off on that. They're headed down a dangerous path, and we got to be very careful about that. All right, 2 Timothy 2.25, we talked about last uh, Thursday. Uh, they're saying even this, even this coming to faith is a gift of God. And uh, we talked about that. Luke chapter 3, uh, uh, verse 8. Seems like we already did that. Luke 3, 8. Oh, I know why I feel like that, because I preached this this morning <laughs> in Iola. This verse. So this morning we were talking about the uh, baptism of Christ. And that was interesting. I'm not going to re-preach it, but uh, uh, just kind of explaining what John's baptism was all about. You know, what does it mean? I, I, I baptized with water unto repentance and all that. So I talked a little bit about that. And here's the verse that a lot of people will point to that are of this repent of your sins, lordship, salvation. It says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Elsewhere it says meat for repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. I think maybe they just stopped reading and didn't read that last half of the verse. I mean, you know, he could raise up, uh, he could raise up children of Abraham from these stones, right? But anyway, he's saying there, he's saying there, this is John the Baptist, and he says, Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. The question is, who's he talking to? You see, all Judea comes to John the Baptist. And he, is the pro he was prophesied in, in Isaiah and in Malachi, you know, that he's going to come and he's going to prepare the way of the Lord and he's going to preach repentance and he's going to straighten the paths and all this. And, and so he's prophesied he's going to do that. So he comes on the scene. All Judea is coming out 
to be baptized by him. And, they, and he's saying, he's, he, they were watching and they're expecting, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is coming. They even start wondering if John's the Messiah. They said, well, they're wondering among themselves, is he the, is he the Christ? And he's just kind of keeping it secret from us or what? And John's saying, no, it's not me, there's another one. By this time, he's already baptized all of Judea. Right? Christ hadn't even been announced yet who he was. And so what John was doing was he was baptizing Old Testament believers. They believed the Messiah was coming, and he's baptizing, saying, hey, prepare the way, clean yourself up, straighten your path. The Messiah is fixing to come. And when you know him, you know, my sheep, uh, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is what Jesus said. When, he, when you see him, you'll be ready to follow him. And he's trying to, trying to get some disciples to follow, some of these, these Jews to become disciples and follow him. Meanwhile, there's some Pharisees sitting off to the side, probably scoffing, probably making fun of them. I don't know what all they were saying. You know, but these guys are probably the whole, you read about the Pharisees, they're trying to live holy. You remember the guy, I thank God that I'm not like this publican over here. He's like, I fast twice a I always want to say twice a day. It's not twice a day. That'd be weird. <laughs> twice a, a week or whatever. I give all my money to the poor and all this kind of stuff. So he's talking about all these great works that he did. Meanwhile, this publican's over here, you know, beating on his chest, saying, God be merciful unto me, a sinner. And so these Pharisees, they thought they were just living perfect. They were just godly. They're going to get into heaven on their works. Every time they saw a sinful person that Jesus would reach out to, they're like, doesn't he know this guy's a sinner? Doesn't he know? You know, <laughs> they were just really ha caught up on this. So they're probably watching all these guys and saying, oh, look at all these sinners getting baptized. Or I don't know what they were saying. But you see that John the Baptist is specifically talking to these guys. You know, he's not talking to everyone who's getting baptized. He's talking to these guys. And so here's what he says, uh, verse 7. He said, uh, he, then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized to him. Now, uh, that's multitude, so you think, yes, yeah, he's talking to everybody. If you go to Matthew 3, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. He's talking to these Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, O generation of vipers. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, uh, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And, they begin, and, and begin not to say within yourself, we, are, we, are Abraham, we have Abraham as our father. So what happened is John the Baptist no doubt sees these guys, and like probably through the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit says, these guys are not believers. These guys won't accept Christ whenever he reveals himself. Now, we know that reading throughout the Bible, uh, you know, other passages of Scripture where, where, uh, where he says, Jesus says, look, you cannot believe. Basically, I've blinded you. I've hardened your heart, you know, because they hardened their heart. And so he turned them over to a reprobate mind. We understand that doctrine. And so what happens is he's saying, you're not going to believe. And so you had all these Jews that were following him along who were totally lost because they would not accept Christ whenever he came. So he was going to the lost sheep of Israel. He was trying to gather them up. So whenever he says, uh, whenever he's saying do, uh, he's saying you need to produce fruits, uh, meat for salvation, or how does he say it? Excuse me. Uh, where's that verse again? Luke, I mean, yeah, Luke 3, 8 says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Look over at Hebrews 6. Here's in essence what he was saying. And this isn't a verse that the Lordship Salvation crowd brings up, but Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. He says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. Now, if you back up, He's talking to save people and he's saying, therefore, leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ. He's like, you already, you're already saved. You already understand, uh, you know what? Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. What does that mean? Well, you're not trusting in your works. You're trusting in God's plan, which is Jesus Christ, right? And you're trusting in that. You already understand faith towards God. You understand the doctrines of baptism. You understand uh, laying on hands of the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. So then he's saying that uh, you need to leave those principal things. And in verse 9, he says, uh, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. And that's basically all John was saying. He was like, look, if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to have to be more 
than just someone who's waiting for the Messiah to come. You're going to have to follow him. And that's what every preacher is trying to get uh, a church congregation to do. You know, we don't try to fill this place up with lost people so we can preach. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say uh, preach the gospel, but really they're not preaching the gospel. I guess they're, they're just trying to condemn everybody and get them to feel real bad about their sins so that they'll come forward to the altar and, and, and you know, repent of their sins or something. But uh, we don't do that. We go outside door to door and we pre when we spread the gospel, get people saved. Now, when we come in here and we meet, guess what we're preaching against? Hey, you need to live right. You need to live holy. People are watching you. You need to uh, bear fruit for Christ. You need, to, um, uh, you, you need to repent of your sins. It's okay in this context to say that. We're not leading anybody to hell and getting them to trust their works. We're saying, uh, you know, these are the things you need to do because we're preaching to believers. So John the Baptist was saying, hey, you guys, those follow, forget those Pharisees over there. They're lost. <laughs> you know, you guys need to do, uh, you guys need to bring forth fruit uh, worthy of repentance. All right, Acts 26, almost done here. Acts 26. He gave a lot of verses, you know. You can't say, like, yeah, they just, you know, they have all these ideas and didn't back it up with any scripture. Well, they sure tried to back it up with scripture. He added a whole lot of scripture in his little uh, nine, nine reasons lordship salvation is right. Acts 26. Let's start at verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He's preaching to Agrippa. So he says, Wherein, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Right? What do we preach whenever we preach the gospel? We preach, hey, you get saved. And then we say, now let me tell you about baptism. <laughs> After they get saved, they should get baptized. It's okay to preach something that, that, you know, that goes along with salvation. But what he's saying here, clearly, if you look back, he's saying they're opening their eyes, turning them from darkness to light. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's talking about the, uh, the faith. They're sanctified by the faith which is in me. That's the gospel that he's preaching. Okay, but then he's, he's telling them, in addition to do the works, uh, uh, met, uh, what, is, what do you say? I'm sorry. Works meet for repentance. Same thing, same concept as Hebrews 6, 9. He's generalizing. He's saying, I went to go preach the gospel. And if you remember, if you study what Paul, what Paul did, he went into uh, cities, preached the gospel, got people saved, gave them some general instructions, and then he left. And then he'd come back and he'd confirm them and he'd teach them a little bit more. Okay, so he's just generalizing his ministry and he's saying, I preach salvation and then I preach that they would do uh, works, you know, along with, with that. So here's the problem. Like I said, you can throw all the verses out there on repentance and you'll win a lot of arguments because people say, oh, he's right. He's got the scripture to back it up. Repent, 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 repent. Right? But what you're missing is all the verses in the Bible that talk about the free gift of salvation. All the verses in the Bible that talk about uh, just believing in Jesus Christ. And so when you start trying to mix the two, uh, you see, man, something's not right. Either the Bible contradicts itself or all these repentance verses mean something differently than what they're claiming that it means. And so the, my conclusion here is that the Lordship Salvation crowd needs to repent. <laughs> They need to repent of their ignorance. They need to repent of their repent of their sins for salvation doctrine. They need to repent of lordship salvation. All right. Father, thank you for your word. And then it's clear. Uh, help us not. Uh, we, we certainly want to study your word. We want to learn and grow more uh, in knowledge of your word. But help us not start studying and getting confused on different verse, verses and, and looking at the world and, and, and scholars, so-called scholars, to explain verses to us uh, because I've watched so many people just fall away and get confused and start preaching a muddy gospel. 
Help us, Lord, just to understand the simplicity of the gospel and the simplicity of salvation. Help us be very clear whenever we explain it to others. We want to be thorough. We want them to understand the gospel, uh, but we can't make anybody uh, believe. We can only trust them if they say they believe the gospel. And I pray that you just help us to be faithful to spreading that seed. Uh, just as a fisherman lays down the, the net or a, or a farmer scatters the seed, uh, we're waiting on you to give the increase, Lord, but uh, we only can, can preach the gospel and, uh, and try to encourage those who, who say they believe the gospel to follow you. But Father, we understand salvation is all about what Jesus did and nothing about what we did. So help us not get that confused and mixed up and help, help us not muddy the gospel, but to make it super clear. I pray you you bless uh, the folks that go out even this afternoon and even in this uh, condition that we're in in our society right now, Lord, I pray that you would just use it for good, continue to call people unto you through the preaching of the word, and I pray that souls will get saved this afternoon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.